Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast. I have had many listener requests to cover arthritis, and I will start what will be a multi-part series of arthritis with discussing psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis in this episode. I may not necessarily release all of the arthritis episodes in order. I may mix some other topics in between as well. As a quick reminder before we get into the questions and answers for this episode, you can follow at RadRev Podcast on Twitter or Instagram, where I post things like physics tips for the ABR core exam, which I am currently posting most days of the week. Let's go ahead and start with the first question for this episode. First question, what are classic imaging findings of psoriatic arthritis? Classic imaging features of psoriatic arthritis are many and include erosive changes with bone proliferation, most commonly involving the interphalangeal joints, meaning the distal and proximal interphalangeal joints, more commonly than the metacarpophalangeal joints in the hands, and the classic erosions typically start marginally and proceed centrally within the joint, which has been termed pencil sharpening. Periosteal new bone formation is classic, and hand involvement is more common than feet involvement. Remember the classic sausage digit where you have the pronounced soft tissue swelling of a single digit. In the spine, psoriatic arthritis classically presents with large lateral paravertebral ossifications that typically have preserved disc spaces and at least relatively preserved facet joints. Whenever you are shown an image of large lateral paraspinous bridging ossification on a board exam, you need to consider the possibility of psoriatic arthritis. There are a lot of imaging findings I just reviewed there. I would go ahead and look up some pictures of psoriatic arthritis if you don't have this already burned into your memory. Also, I will have a study guide for this episode available on my website, theradiologyreview.com, that you can go ahead and download for free to review some of this information as well. Next question, what are key differences between rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis? First of all, let's talk about distribution. Rheumatoid arthritis is often symmetric, and psoriatic arthritis is often asymmetric. Rheumatoid arthritis favors the metacarpophalangeal joints, and as I already have said, psoriatic arthritis favors the interphalangeal joints. Psoriasis classically has bony proliferation, whereas rheumatoid arthritis does not. That is not an all-inclusive list, but those are some key differences that can help you differentiate between rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. Also, bone mineral density. Rheumatoid arthritis is associated with osteoporosis, unlike psoriasis. And let's talk briefly about laboratory testing. Psoriatic arthritis is a seronegative process. On the other hand, rheumatoid arthritis has classic laboratory markers to include rheumatoid factor. Next, what are key differences between reactive arthritis and psoriatic arthritis? And in terms of boardsmanship for radiology board exams, knowing key differences between the different forms of arthritis is something I think is high yield and worth your time. You need to know enough classic features for each of these, and especially features that might be unique for one versus the other, in order to get multiple choice examinations on imaging manifestations of arthritis correct. So, what are key differences between reactive arthritis and psoriatic arthritis? First of all, let's talk about something that is similar. 
both of these entities are associated with bone proliferative changes and osseous erosions. Additionally, both can have sausage digits. Furthermore, both are associated with unilateral sacroiliitis or bilateral asymmetric sacroiliitis. Essentially, these are really difficult to differentiate based on imaging. And that is actually probably the key take-home message for this question, is that key differences between reactive arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, at least based on imaging, are few. However, psoriasis is more common in the hands and reactive arthritis is more common in the feet. That is not an absolute rule to differentiate these, but is something that might help you out on a board exam question. Principally, you will want to use clinical history to differentiate these. Psoriasis will have classic clinical manifestations to include skin changes that most commonly occur prior to bony changes, but this is not always the case. Reactive arthritis will often give you a history that includes a recent infectious illness. Next question. What are key differences between erosive osteoarthritis and psoriatic arthritis? Erosive osteoarthritis is most classic for seagull, that is S-E-A-G-U-L-L, like the bird, seagull erosions, which are central erosions, with osteophyte formation. If you don't know what those central or seagull erosions look like, please look it up. Psoriatic arthritis, on the other hand, will typically have peripheral erosions. So again, erosive osteoarthritis is most classic for central erosions, which are sometimes called seagull erosions, and psoriatic arthritis will have peripheral erosions. Erosive osteoarthritis will not have bone proliferative changes as with psoriasis. A presentation in a postmenopausal woman would favor erosive osteoarthritis. Diffuse swelling of the digit, which is the sausage digit appearance, is seen with psoriasis and not erosive osteoarthritis. Next question. What are top differential considerations for unilateral versus bilateral sacroiliitis? There are different patterns of sacroiliitis that you really should have down cold for radiology board exams. This is not all-inclusive, but if you see bilateral symmetric sacroiliitis, I would think of ankylosing spondylitis first. If you see unilateral sacroiliitis, think infection versus psoriatic arthritis versus reactive arthritis. Again, I would like to drive home that the imaging manifestations of psoriatic arthritis and reactive arthritis are very similar. If you see bilateral asymmetric sacroiliitis, think psoriasis or reactive arthritis. An infectious process would not be expected to be bilateral even if asymmetric, but psoriatic or reactive arthritis could certainly do that. Next, what are classic imaging features in the spine of ankylosing spondylitis? Buzzwords for ankylosing spondylitis include shiny corners, with sclerosis involving the corners of the vertebral bodies, as well as the bamboo spine appearance, with diffuse syndesmophytes that may fracture with trauma. The Romanus lesion, that is R-O-M-A-N-U-S, Romanus lesion, maybe I said that right, maybe I didn't, I don't know, is an MRI finding of early ankylosing spondylitis, and that manifests as edema in the corners of the vertebral bodies. And when I say edema on MRI, you should automatically think T1 dark and T2 bright. And this Romanus lesion, which is an early MRI finding of ankylosing spondylitis, which is the edema that you can see in the corners of the vertebral bodies, will eventually progress to show the classic syndesmophytes and shiny corners on CT or X-ray. Next question. Ankylosing spondylitis is most associated with lung disease in which distribution? 
I will put out a plug now. That I did provide several episodes previously on lung diseases by distribution. So if this question seems far off from what you know, you might want to visit some of those episodes and read about this on your own as well. The answer I'm looking for for this question is that ankylosing spondylitis is associated with upper low predominant interstitial lung disease with small cystic spaces. Next question. True or false? If you see spine disease suggestive of ankylosing spondylitis with absence of sacroiliac involvement, this is still likely ankylosing spondylitis. The answer here is false. Spine disease without sacroiliac joint disease is unlikely to be seen with ankylosing spondylitis. So remember that ankylosing spondylitis almost always will involve the sacroiliac joints as well as the spine. So if you see spine only, you need to consider other entities first. Next, why might one consider radiation therapy to the hip following hip replacement in a patient with ankylosing spondylitis? The answer here is that for patients with ankylosing spondylitis, prophylactic radiotherapy after hip replacement may be considered due to a high likelihood of developing pronounced heterotopic ossification around that hip arthroplasty that can cause subsequent joint stiffness. And generally, when people have had their hip replaced, they do not want joint stiffness. So if they have ankylosing spondylitis, you could go ahead and consider prophylactic radiotherapy after that hip replacement to reduce the likelihood of developing significant heterotopic ossification and subsequent joint stiffness. Next question. Can you name classic spondyloarthropathies that have an HLA B27 association? Some answers for this question include ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease-related arthritis. Those all have an HLA B27 association. And to drive home the fact once again, psoriatic arthritis and reactive arthritis appear very similar on imaging, and they both have an HLA B27 association. Next question. Can you differentiate on imaging the skeletal findings from ankylosing spondylitis and inflammatory bowel disease-related arthritis? The answer here is classically no. You typically cannot differentiate on imaging the skeletal findings of ankylosing spondylitis from inflammatory bowel disease-related arthritis. Similar to the similarity between psoriatic arthritis and reactive arthritis, the imaging manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis and inflammatory bowel disease are very similar to each other. You must therefore rely on other findings and clinical history to differentiate these entities. For example, characteristic bone findings of ankylosing spondylitis versus inflammatory bowel disease-related arthritis in a patient with a colostomy that you can see in the field of view is more likely to be inflammatory bowel disease-related arthritis. A take-home point for questions on radiology board exams that ask about arthritis is to use every bit of information they provide. If they throw in a small detail, either in the clinical history or show you an image of something that is somewhat unusual, such as a colostomy, you need to use all of the information at hand to narrow down the differential considerations and arrive at the correct answer. Last and final question for this episode. What are differences between the imaging manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis and diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis in the spine that is also called DISH, D-I-S-H, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis? A really basic answer to this question is that bulky osteophytes 
with disk space preservation is most likely to be diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, which is also called DISH, D-I-S-H. Shiny corners with syndesmophytes is classic for ankylosing spondylitis. As a reminder, psoriatic arthritis can also involve the spine and is associated with unilateral large bridging osteophytes most classically. That is a pretty complicated episode, so I say let's leave it there for now. Go ahead and download the study guide on this episode reviewing classic features predominantly of psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis that you can access on my website, theradiologyreview.com. I have other free downloadable study guides and other free radiology board review resources available on my website, so check that out if you would like. Thank you for listening to this episode. Keep up the good work and continue to study hard. Remember, you have to study really hard to succeed on radiology board exams, so prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.